this is a very special day, a really, really special day. It is the biggest party of my life. I am the star. There's the food, the festivities, the grandioseness of, of it all. My friends and family are coming from all over. They're my cousins, distant cousins, aunties and uncles, nephews and nieces, the happy hugs, the congratulations, the moments of joy. It's all so precious. It's all so perfect. I have henna on my hands, a beautiful red sari. I feel like an Indian princess. It is my wedding day. Am I excited? Yes. Am I nervous? Not really. Am I sad? Absolutely not. I'm 21 years old, raised in a conservative, sheltered family. Mental age, probably 15. I'm about to marry a man I barely know. I had an arranged marriage, yeah, where they get two sets of people, they match them all together. They tell you it has worked for generations, why wouldn't it for you? It's quite contrary to the consenting adults. For me, the marriage was an exciting day. I was going to be the belle of the ball. I was excited. I was not forced. I was not unhappy at all. My culture, the norms had taught me that as a young Indian woman, I had to get married and bear children. This was the way, the only way. I had no say in the matter. I was merely performing. That day, I became the property of my husband's family. Things were not so normal. They didn't seem quite equal. I craved to be myself. I craved equality. I wondered what to do. It wasn't easy. I wanted to perform, lead in a play that was being written by me. I wondered. It took a lot of courage, a lot of strength, a lot of help from friends, family, strangers alike to give me the courage to be me. But how could I, an Indian girl, potentially reject a man chosen for me? It wasn't easy. Probably the darkest moments of my life. My dad didn't speak to me for six months. My sister abandoned me. For my friends, I was an outcast. I cried a lot. I cried and cried. And in those moments, the fetal position in the closet, I often wondered what this quest for equality was. Was it truly important to be yourself? Well, it all started something like this. My mom and me. My mom loves me. I'm about eight, I think. It's a very happy family. There is nothing quite unusual about this, except there is. My mom is a physicist. She works in the national labs. She does research on solar systems. She attends international conferences, publishes papers, writes about sunspot numbers. Things to this day, I hardly understand. My culture taught me the norms were mom stayed at home and dad's worked. The little Anjali's mind, something must be clearly wrong with my family. My mother is the only one who goes to work. I wondered, perhaps a judgment on my dad. Was he incapable of taking care of his family all by himself? I had no notion of equality at this point in time. I had a very happy family. My mom's day, she gets up at five, she gets us ready, makes us breakfast, sends us to school, goes to work, comes back home. There is the tea time, the dinner time. She's cooking, cleaning, puts us to bed. She loves us a lot. My dad's day, he goes to work, period. He loves us a lot. There was 
was nothing wrong for me in this. There was nothing that was not equal. This was what the culture was teaching me. It took me decades to think that maybe something wasn't equal, maybe this wasn't right. But then perception, reality, the lines kind of get blurred. And then you wonder, you wonder why this quest for equality? Maybe it's in the pursuit of happiness. Maybe you believe that if men, women, whites, blacks, gay, straights, if everybody somehow were treated equal, that they would be happier. The world would suddenly become a happier place. I don't know. If I had been more supportive of my mother, if my sister, my dad, the society had been more supportive of her, would she have been better at her job? More perplexing is the question, would she have been happier? I know my mother for 40 plus years. I don't know the answer to that. So I wonder, is it truly, really important to be yourself? Fast forward a decade or two, a decade plus. Here's where I wish. I had a story, you know, the kind of story that moves people. You read, reread, reread. The rags to riches story. Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, humble background. His one-way ticket to the United States from India cost more than his dad's entire annual salary. It moved me. Diane Bryant, homeless at 18. She runs a $20 billion business, server business. She's the top exec woman at Intel. It moves me. I don't have an exotic story like that. I didn't grow up in a village. I'm not a CEO. My parents were both scientists. And I didn't have a choice not to go to college. So like the majority of the people, the IIT undergrads, I decided to do what they all do, come to the United States. I left the vibrant culture, the traditions, the norms, the family values. I was leaving it all behind. Two bags, 50 pounds each. That's all you're allowed to carry. I was leaving it all for the United States. The tall buildings, the hustle bustle, the excitement, the exuberance, gray suits. I expected New York. It's another story that I ended up in a and College Station, Texas. <laughs> My perception was that I was landing in the land of freedom, the land of equality. As days passed by, I wondered, was it so equal? Was it so free? I'm an engineer. First job, multinational company. Before I get my first paycheck, before my first day at the job, I do what I like to do the most. I go shopping. What do I buy? Gray skirts, black pants. Gray skirts, black pants. Gray skirts, black pants. Very soon, I have a closet full of grays and blacks. That's who I was. I was an engineer in a business world. I was supposed to be in a gray skirt or black pants. I was performing, again. It took me years and years to admit to myself and the world, I might be different. I like pink. I love sparkles. I like a closet full of colors that doesn't make me any less of an engineer than anyone else. Why is it that equality meant I had to follow the majority, in this case, men? Equality meant that I could be different. I could be myself. So this perception, reality, it wasn't really making sense to me. And now we are in this decade. I wonder if this land of freedom, this land of equality, is it really so free or really so equal? 2012, December the 16th, 2012. 
the Nirbhaya case, a 23-year-old medical intern, gang raped, beaten, tortured to death in a bus in Munirka, a suburb in South Delhi, India. It shook the nation. It shook the world. There are documentaries on it. There's a BBC documentary. There is a Canadian film. They're all talking about the social and the traditional values that caused this horrendous act to be even feasible. But I wonder if this is only India. We are in the presidential elections right now. One of the candidates, with his lewd locker room talks, and the other one, with the husband and the story we all know. When the sex talk tapes came about, there were a lot of women who came forward, things about men, things they said they didn't want, and certainly had not welcomed. It gave us all a forum to at least talk about not being tolerant anymore about the status quo. So I fundamentally believe it is the optimism for the future is that so long as you follow some tenets, for me, the three ones are be truthful, be honest, be respectful. After that, can we be ourselves? My mother didn't follow status quo. I am my mother's daughter. I will not follow status quo. I fundamentally believe that the most beautiful quality in equality is the ability to be truly yourself. Um, I love Dr. Seuss. I want to end with him. Today, you're you. That's truer than true. There is no one alive you are than you. Thank you.